You can see your face in it. Is it, is it going to crash? Oh, the humanity. No, no. No, leveling out. Here it comes. Coming down. Here it comes. And down, and down. Is it going to land? No? <laughs> Just long enough. Looks like he dropped something off. Wonder what that is. And off he goes again. Let's look. What's that down there? Professor Sprott, is that you? <laughs> But you're so tiny. Ah, oh, I get it. That's how you fit in the blimp. All right, all right. But how are you going to do the show? I'll get a magnifying glass and then we'll. It's just an idea. What are you pointing at? This thing. Well, got lots of dials and knobs and switches and things. Looks pretty scientific. All right. I'll turn that on. Give this a flip. Flashing lights. Big arc. Duct tape. This must be scientific. <laughs> All right. Yes, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Ladies and gentlemen, that miracle of deminiaturization appearing in his 154th performance, the man who makes you wonder about physics, Professor Cliff Brown. Welcome to the wonders of physics. Now, you all know that I didn't really come in on that uh, helium-filled blip. Yeah. You knew that, right? <laughs> but I would like to talk to you today about the physics of transportation. Did you know that there's a lot of physics involved in all of the different ways we have of going from one place to another? Now, I want to show you one type of transportation that I'll bet you're all familiar with. How many have a bicycle? Oh, good. So you will recognize this device right here. What is this? That's right, it's a bicycle wheel, but this one's very heavy because it's filled with concrete. There are many interesting things we can do with a heavy bicycle wheel. We can suspend it from the ceiling and make what we call a pendulum. That's not very interesting, it just swings back and forth, but if Mr. Lovell will give it a spin, you'll notice something very interesting. It seems to defy gravity. It's not falling, but it is twirling around. And that's a principle of gyroscopic motion. And that's a very important principle in transportation. Because when you ride your bicycle, have you ever noticed that if you're going nice and fast, you don't fall over? And that's because of the stability of the gyroscope. What do you think would happen if I'd stand up on this platform with the gyroscope in my hand? Let's try that. Well, not very much. But let's see if I hold it over my head. So I can make myself go either way. And this is an important principle of physics that's called Newton's third law of motion. When the bicycle wheel goes one way, that forces me to go the other way. And uh, many uh, principles of transportation work on that basis. Here's another bicycle wheel, and this bicycle wheel has a railroad track on it, and it has a train. Let's make the train go. 
You notice when the train goes forward, the bicycle wheel goes backwards. So we can turn it around. So whichever way the train goes, the bicycle wheel goes the opposite way because of this principle of action and reaction. Now another example of action and reaction makes use of this device. It's an old fire extinguisher. It has carbon dioxide in it. Normally carbon dioxide is a gas, but if you put it under sufficient pressure, it becomes a liquid. So there's a little bit of liquid in here, and when, but I, when I release it, it vaporizes and comes out as a stream of carbon dioxide gas. So let's stand up on the platform and see what happens. So it makes me go around, but how do I stop? The other way. Good idea. Let's try that. And so indeed, I can make myself go either way depending on which way I fire it. So that's the principle of the rocket. And you know, if we're to ever to go somewhere away from the Earth, we have to use rockets. Because all of the ways we move around on the Earth rely on pushing against something. When you drive your car, the wheels have to touch the road, right? When you're on a railroad train, the wheels have to touch the railroad tracks. Even when you're in an airplane, the airplane has to push against the air in order to go forward. But when you're in outer space, there's nothing to push against. And so you have to use Newton's third law if you're ever going anywhere in outer space. Now here's an example of that. It's a little uh, rocket that I bought at the toy store, and it has a little bit of water in it, and it has some air. And when I pump uh, pressure into the air here, and then release it, some of the air will come out the back and take the water along with it. The water going that way will propel the rocket that way. So let's put some pressure in it, and release it, and see where it goes. So that's Newton's third law. I have another example of that here that uses a cylinder of the same carbon dioxide gas that I used over on the rotating platform, except it's very small. But it has that uh, carbon dioxide in it. And on one end is a very thin diaphragm, a metal diaphragm. And if one were to puncture that, the carbon dioxide would come out very rapidly, and it would push this forward. Now, we actually have one of those in the base of this little model rocket here. And it's sitting on the head of a very, sh or the, t the point of a very sharp nail. So what I'm going to do is take the hammer and hit it. That will puncture the diaphragm on the bottom. The carbon dioxide will come out the bottom, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> That's right. It went all the way to the top, and it, it made kind of a mess here with all the water and everything. So we'll have to clean that up. Well, uh, excuse me, but who are you? I'm the man from plaid. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're certainly wearing plaid, all right. And uh, what brings you here today? Well, I heard uh, word of a fashion faux pas. So I figured I'd, and I think it must be you because it was a cummerbund. I think you should shut your head up. I don't think that's me. Mm, OK. But uh, what else have you brought? Well, well <clears throat> my uh, jetpack was in the shop, so I have my rocket-powered tricycle. Well, now that's a pretty neat gadget. How does that work? Well, we have, uh, we have a fire extinguisher right here, which has CO2 in it. And I actuate it. CO2 goes out that way, which is the action. And then, as a reaction, I go this way. Uh-huh. Well, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah? That's pretty neat. Did you bring anything else with you? Uh, Oh, yeah, I found these things. Uh, these, they have these things out front. You know, if you look through these, you, everything looks plaid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe it's you. Well, well, uh, I don't know. Well, that's pretty neat. Could I have those? Oh, I'd, sure. I'd really yeah. love to have a pair of those. Yeah. Oh, gee, you're right. That's, that's really amazing. Yeah, it's called a diffraction grating. Diffraction grating. Yeah. Huh. Well, can I keep these? Um, OK. Yeah. Oh, oh, great. I'd yeah. love to have a pair of those. Well, you know, we should give you something for your trouble. Would you like a cookie? Uh, yeah, I'll take a cookie. Okay. <laughs> Can you cool it down? Like, make it cold? You like your cookies cold? Yeah, I like them cold. Well, hmm. Mm. <laughs> we have some liquid nitrogen. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Mm, 
Well, you do understand this is at 321 degrees below zero Fahrenheit? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. 196 below zero Celsius? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, that's fine. A mere 77 degrees above the absolute coldest anything can possibly be? 77. That was about what Hawaii was last week, wasn't it? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Doesn't get that cold around here. Uh, that's okay. Well, now I've got a cold. How do you propose I get it out of there? I'm not going to touch it. Well, uh, well, you got those tongs there. I suppose you could use them. Yeah, I suppose I could pick it up with these tongs. That would be very dangerous to touch it, I think. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Well, all right. Looks like it's really cold. And don't drop it on the floor. Because <laughs> I don't eat things on, on the floor. I never drop it on the floor. Mm. You're not going to touch that. Well, I think so. I probably should eat it. <laughs> hmm. That was a good cookie. Hmm. Well, thanks a lot. That's pretty amazing. Oh, hey, thanks. Man from plaid, man from plaid, someone's in the back with checkers and cords. Oh, they're clashing. Ooh, better get going. Does that thing have a reverse on it? Uh, no, I never go in reverse. Oh. People just get out of my way. Uh-oh. Good thing this is a girl's bike. Mm. <laughs> mm. Well. How many miles a gallon you get from that thing? Oh. I don't know. Well, don't I, know huh? I, I, I haven't I didn't been a mile yet. Had, no, I don't think I have. Probably, uh, probably a good thing too. I guess. I guess. I guess. Now let's see if this thing will work. I really do want to get out of here. <laughs> Most automobiles, of course, work using gasoline engines. And inside the engine of the car that uh, you have or your family has is a cylinder. Well, here's a cylinder. In fact, there are several of these. You might have a six-cylinder car or even more. And uh, inside the cylinder, of course, you put a little bit of gasoline. The gasoline squirts in. And we have something in here. It's not gasoline, but it's something even more familiar. You probably all have some of this at home. It's alcohol. It's like rubbing alcohol. There's a little bit in the bottom. And, of course, the alcohol vaporizes, and so there's a little bit of alcohol vapor here. The same thing happens in the cylinder of your car. Some uh, uh, gas vapor, gasoline vapor, the fumes from the, the gasoline, are in the cylinder. Now, of course, we need a little bit of air because uh, gasoline or alcohol don't burn without air, so I put a little air in. So we've got a little air in there. Mix it up good. And I put a cork on the top. Now, that's a little like the piston that's in the cylinder of your car. Now, of course, to make this work, we need a spark. You know your car has spark plugs. So here's a device that makes a spark. It's a small Tesla coil. We're going to show you a big Tesla coil later, but it makes a spark. You can see those sparks right here. So what I'm going to do is hold this in my hand with these tongs, and I'm going to touch the spark to a little screw that goes through one side of the bottle, and that will make a spark inside, and we'll see what happens. and up to the ceiling it goes. Now you may not realize that the same thing happens in your car all the time when your engine is running. It's not blowing the cork to the ceiling, but it is pushing the piston up, and you have a bunch of these, and they're going many times every second, and that's making the crankshaft go around, and that's eventually turning the wheels and making your car go forward. And so that uh, kind of shows how a gasoline engine works. Um, now, um, we've been talking about gases and their properties, and of course uh, this uh, blimp I came in on had a particular gas in it. What do you think was the gas in that blimp that I came in on? Helium. Why do you think it's helium? Because it was rising. That's right. Now I have back here another balloon that in fact is filled with helium. If I let it go, where, what will happen? It'll go up? Do you think it'll go all the way up to the ceiling? Let's try it. I'll give it some string here. Why did it stop? The string? It's not attached to anything. Not enough, not enough helium, and so why does that matter? What do you think? 
Why do you think it stopped? The string is too heavy. Good idea. So if I cut off some of the string, it maybe will be able to lift it up, right? So you know there's a clever thing I can do. If I cut off the string right at the table, I know that the upward force lifting the balloon is just balanced by the weight of the string. So let's do that right about at the table here, about like that. And then I can bring it out here. And I have a balloon connected to a piece of string. And the, the weight of the string is just about exactly balanced by the lifting force on the balloon. So if I let it go, it may rise, but it rises very, very slowly. And actually, I cut just a little bit of extra string off because it turns out that over time, a little bit of the helium will, um, will um, get through the rubber on the, of the balloon, and it will come down again. And so in about five or 10 minutes, uh, it may come down. If it comes down over your head, maybe you can take your fingernail clippers or something and cut off about a centimeter off the bottom of the string and let it go again. And it will wander around the room in response to the air currents that are in the room. You could, of course, do this at home. You've probably all had helium balloons before, right? And if you have one of these helium balloons, just tie it to some heavy string and do what I just did, let it go up, cut it even with the floor, and then you can see where the air is moving in your house. That's very interesting. You can see where the hot, where the hot air comes in from your heater and where it goes out, and maybe if the window's open or something, you can see whether the air is coming in or out of the window. So we'll just watch that for a while. And that's uh, really pretty amazing that uh, a balloon will do that. And in fact, it seems as if it defies gravity, right? Did I hear gravity, sir? Well, yes, uh, we were speaking of gravity, but may I ask who you are? Newton. Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton. But, but Isaac Newton has been dead for 300 years. I've just come down from the fifth dimension. And I see you've... Just to see you. And I see you've brought an animal with you. Who is this, this uh, is, creature? This is Dobbin. Dobbin. Well, hello, Dobbin. <laughs> Do you like horses? Oh, oh I, yes, horses are fine. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. In fact, uh, here, Dobbin. <laughs> Dobbin doesn't like apples. Doesn't like apples? All horses like apples. No, do not Dobbin. No? No. Do you want to hear the terrible story? Oh, uh, yes, please. Why does Dobbin not like apples? Well, a long time ago, <laughs> Dobbin and I were in an orchard. And I was asleep, but Dobbin was wandering around, and a big apple hit him on the head. And he came to me and said, the theory of gravity. So I woke up and said, right, the theory of gravity. So I wrote it down in the book, and now it's known as Newton's theory of gravity, and I'm famous. But it was Dobbin's idea. You couldn't have Dobbin's theory of gravity, could you? No, 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 no. So that's why I'm famous, my theory of gravity. And you said you can't get rid of gravity? No, absolutely not. Look. They'll come down. I invented gravity. I can get rid of gravity. Oh, I find that hard to believe. Besides. You believe me? Yes, yes. I can get rid of Dobbin and I can get rid of gravity. All right, all right. Now then, all those who want me to get rid of gravity say I. I. Dobbin's not very good at hearing. I. That's not very good. <laughs> Let's have it once more. All those who want Dobbin and I to get rid of gravity say I. I. And all those who want to stay the same say no. The eyes are above the nose. <laughs> bye bye. Well, that was pretty amazing, Isaac Newton. He has been dead for 300 years, but he did live over in England, and uh, our visitor did have an English accent. But you know, he looked an awful lot like Professor George Rowlands, who's visiting us from uh, the University of Warwick. But uh, you just never know uh, who will pop in and uh, what they'll do or say. So where were we? We were talking about balloons and uh, gases and things. And I have here another balloon. What do you think's in this balloon? Hydrogen? Helium? 
Well, you know, it could be either hydrogen or helium because both of those gases are less dense than air. And if you put them in a balloon, they would rise just like that. How could we tell the difference? Burn it? Well, okay. That's right. Hydrogen is a flammable gas. That means it burns. Helium is an inert gas. It doesn't burn. So if we take a match, put it on the end of a long stick so I can put it up near the balloon, strike the match, and we can put it near the balloon and see if the gas burns. Well, it popped the balloon, but it didn't burn. So that gas was indeed helium. Now, would you like to see me do this again? Yes. We will light another match. And you see Mr. Lovell with his fingers in his ears? If loud noises bother you, you may want to do the same, just in case this is not helium. Well, as you might have guessed, that gas was hydrogen. And not only did it burn, but it burned in an explosive manner. And you may have heard that uh, long, long ago, in fact, about 1937, there used to be uh, hydrogen-filled dirigibles that went across the ocean, and they carried people. And there was one in particular called the Hindenburg that could carry like 100 people across the ocean. And in 1937, uh, it actually caught on fire when it was landing in New Jersey, and it killed some people. And it turns out that uh, the same thing would have probably happened even if it had been filled with helium, because although the hydrogen burned, most of the injuries and the damage was due to the burning uh, material that enclosed the gas and also the fuel that was used to propel it forward. And so, uh, but in any case, uh, hydrogen is not used in uh, balloons very much anymore because it's potentially dangerous. And uh, we do have uh, helium balloons that are used quite a bit today. Now that made a very loud noise, so maybe it's appropriate to talk a little bit about sound. We have here a loudspeaker, just like on your stereo set at home, and this loudspeaker is connected to a thing that makes a peculiar kind of sound. The sound is a little like the sound that would be made if I wrapped my knuckles on the wood here. Like that, that's sort of hard on the knuckles. So we have a little electric circuit that makes the same sound. You all hear that? Now that's coming out of the speaker right here, and you can see on our oscilloscope, that yellow trace up at the top, there's a little spike that goes up and that's where the sound appears. Okay, now we're going to listen to the sound, not with our ears, but with a special microphone. Where have you seen a microphone like this? That's right, at a football game. On the sidelines at the football games, they often have these and they point them at the football players. Why do you think they do that? Why do you think? They want to try to hear maybe what plays they're calling in the huddle, maybe you think? Well, that's one theory. And, uh, but, you know, I think the reason they're probably doing it is to hear the grunts and the groans and the collisions, because that sounds real good on television, right? So that's what this is, a very sensitive microphone that can pick up sounds from far away. And I'm going to use this uh, to show the speed of sound. So if I turn this on, put it over by the speaker, you can see that the sound, the yellow uh, trace there, is the sound that is being produced and you can see the trace on the bottom is what the microphone is picking up. Now you see first of all that there's a little bit of delay if I stop talking. Uh, it occurs a little bit farther to, to the right and that means later in time. You also notice that it, it doesn't look anything like that nice square pulse that's going in. And that's because there are echoes back and forth in the room so the sound bounces around for a little while before it eventually dies out. But the interesting thing to show you is what happens if I now just back away from the speaker with the microphone, so watch. So it moves farther and farther to the right, and that means it's taking some time for the sound to travel from the speaker over to the microphone. You also notice that the little pulse is not quite so big, that means it's not so loud over here, and that makes sense. So let me come back and you'll see it uh, uh, recover. Okay, another example of where sound appears in transportation is something called the Doppler effect. Have you ever stood alongside the highway when a car comes by sounding its horn? You know what it sounds like? It sounds something like, Ew. you've all heard that, right? 
but maybe you haven't thought about why it sounds that way. When the car is coming toward you, it's a higher pitch. And then when it's going away from you, it's a lower pitch. That's why it starts high, yeah, and then goes low, oh, like that. And that's the Doppler effect. And of course, it's not just for cars, it's for any sound that is traveling toward you. For example, a train coming toward you behaves the same. So that's the Doppler effect, and I have a little gadget here that will illustrate that. Here's a whistle, and if air blows on the whistle, it makes a sound. But rather than blow air on the whistle, what I'm going to do is put it on the end of an arm, and there's a motor that will make it go around. So at some times, the, the whistle will be coming toward you, and you'll hear a high pitch. At other times, the whistle will be coming away from you, and you'll hear a low pitch. So let me turn it on and let you listen to that. So can you hear that funny sound? It goes woo 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 woo. And that's because the, the pitch is high and low, high and low, very, very rapidly. Another thing that's important in transportation is electricity. You probably know uh, people are talking about making electric cars that have electric motors instead of gasoline engines. And of course there are electric trains. They have lots of them in Europe and Japan and other countries. We have a few here, but not too many. And someday we'll probably have more. But electricity is used to propel um, things, and of course, even in our cars, you have uh, headlights and radios and uh, instruments on the dashboard and all kinds of things, all kinds of ways electricity is used. And to illustrate uh, one principle of electricity, I will need a very brave volunteer. Who would like to help? You want to help? Come down here. Turn around. Tell us your name. Daniel. Daniel. Okay, Daniel. Uh, hey. <laughs> Stop. See the people up there? This is fun, isn't it? Are you going to be a scientist someday? Yeah, maybe you'll get to stand in front of all these people and make a fool of yourself someday. <laughs> but not yet. We won't make you do that today, Daniel. Daniel, you like science? Are you good at it? You are, huh? Well, you know, Daniel, have you ever been out where there's lightning and thunder? and Does that scare you? Doesn't, huh? Well, you know, you should be careful because lightning can hurt you. You know that, don't you? So if you're ever outside and there's a uh, um, lightning crashing, you shouldn't be under a big tall tree or something. You're, you're smart enough to know that, right? Okay, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, are you feeling brave today? You want to help us with the demonstration? Okay, turn around and walk right over to this cage. And have a seat in what looks very much like an electric chair. <laughs> you want to use someone else? No, we don't have anything else. It's this or nothing. We, <laughs> Daniel? Daniel, this is the safest room in the house. Trust me, I'm a scientist. <laughs> and on Daniel's right is a million volt Tesla coil. Makes a little bit of noise, but you won't feel a thing. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> now, the next thing we want to show you with the big Tesla coil is a little too dangerous to ask for a volunteer. And so we're going to ask one of our assistants, <laughs> Steve Narf, who actually helped us set up most of these demonstrations, is uh, preparing to step up on uh, an insulated platform uh, about a meter off the ground. And you notice on this platform is a little tray, a metal tray, and it's got water in it. And it's also got a sheet of copper. The sheet of copper is connected through a copper tube to the terminal of the million volt Tesla coil. Now you notice that Steve has taken his shoes and socks off and he's standing in the tray. Don't do this at home. <laughs> this is very dangerous. Uh, whenever you're working around electricity, you never want to have your shoes and socks off and you never want to stand in water. But you notice that uh, Steve has a funny headband on, and in fact, uh, he put water on that. And that's just in case any sparks come off his head. We don't want to set his hair on fire. <laughs> that would be bad. He's now putting a crown on his head. That looks a little peculiar. And believe it or not, that's a lightning rod. 
because if sparks come off his head, we don't want it to come directly off his skin where it could be injurious to him. And so the, any sparks that come off will actually come off the lightning rod, those little points on the end of that. You notice he's putting metal thimbles on his fingers. The thimbles also have little points on the end so that if sparks come off his fingers, they'll come off the thimbles rather than directly off his skin where it could injure him. <laughs> and so you will now see why we call Steve Narf the human conductor. pretty amazing. You notice Steve has taken the thimbles off his fingers, so to protect his hands, we'll give him in one hand a 2,000 watt light bulb. And in, No, your hand. In the other hand, we'll give him a fluorescent light bulb, much like you have at home, and that is in the fixtures overhead. And just for good measure, someone out in the audience there will uh, have another fluorescent light bulb. So once again, Steve Narf, the human conductor. another demonstration that involves transportation and electricity. You all have bicycles, right? Well, we have a particular kind of bicycle here whose wheels don't touch the ground. Have you ever seen one of those? You have, huh? Yeah, it's an exercise bicycle. And uh, this exercise bicycle is a lot like your bicycle. Do you have a bicycle with a light on it that you use when you ride at night? That's right. Well, ours has a light. In fact, it has two lights. They're very big lights. They're automobile headlights, and uh, uh, so they're very powerful. Now, the lights you have on your bicycle probably have batteries, right? Or maybe you have one of those generators that goes around when you're pedaling. Well, that's what we have here. We have a very powerful generator that one can, uh, can pedal and make electricity. And the electricity will then light the uh, light bulbs. But it's a lot of work, and so to do this, we need an expert biker, and I think I saw someone outside that was riding a bicycle not very long ago. Well, hi there. What's your name? I'm Bicycle. Excuse me. I'm Bicycle Bill. Bicycle Bill. Well, that's a good name for you, and I see you have a little tiny bicycle there. Where'd you get that? Uh, well, I don't remember where I got it, but it used to be bigger. Used to be bigger. Well, you know, we have a gadget back here that makes things bigger. Maybe we could uh, fix it up for you so it uh, fits you better. That would be great. Yeah, we could do that later, but if you have a minute, I wonder if you could help us demonstrate making electricity by pedaling a bicycle. Sure. Well, put your bike down. Come over here to our special exercise bike. And hop on and uh, pedal away and see if you can make enough electricity to light these light bulbs. Well, that's pretty amazing. Uh, how, mu how much power do you think you're producing there? Maybe about a quarter of a, kilo a quarter of a horsepower. A quarter of a horsepower. You know, we had a horse in here not 10 minutes ago. He did a whole horsepower. Could he ride a bike? Well, no, he couldn't ride a bike. But uh, yeah, I guess that's about right because a horsepower is about 750 watts. And uh, a quarter of that would be almost 200 watts, and these are about 75 watts apiece. So, yeah, you're making about 150 watts. How long could you do that? Not very long. Well, maybe we'd better let you quit. And the light goes out. So that's right. Well, thank you very much for demonstrating that for us. So uh, feel free to visit us anytime you're in the neighborhood. Well, thank you very much.
Well, that's right. You have to pedal your bike pretty hard to make 200 watts or 150 watts. That's a lot of uh, electricity. And uh, you have to work hard to do that. You know, one of the things they talk about is making cars that run on hydrogen. You've probably heard of that. And uh, how does that work? Well, uh, hydrogen, of course, is a gas that burns. You saw the hydrogen balloon. And if you burn hydrogen and oxygen, uh, you could use that as a source of fuel. And so it's a very clean source of fuel because do you know what you get when you burn hydrogen? Somebody said you get water. That's right. Water is H2O, right? So if you burn hydrogen in the air, the hydrogen combines with the oxygen in the air, you get water. So it's a very clean form of energy that would make cars that have very low pollution. Now, the problem, of course, is somehow you have to make the hydrogen. Well, we get some hydrogen from oil wells and things, but if we're going to drill oil wells, we might as well just use the oil. There is another way to make hydrogen, however, and that uses the process of electrolysis. That is to say, you can start with water, which is H2O, and you can split it up into the hydrogen and oxygen. And we have such a gadget back here that does precisely that. So I'm going to turn it on and show it to you. Here we have a little U-shaped tube, and it's got water in it. But the water, in this case, has a little bit of sulfuric acid in it. And that's to make it a good electrical conductor. So in one side of the tube, there's a positive uh, electrode. The other side is a negative electrode. And you see bubbles coming up on both sides. And in fact, if you look carefully, uh, either up there or down here, uh, this one is making about twice as much as that one. So that's a clue that this is maybe hydrogen, and that's oxygen. Remember, two atoms of hydrogen for every one atom of oxygen. So we're actually splitting the water up into hydrogen and oxygen. When I was about the age of some of you, I used to do this at home. You take a little tray like this, take two uh, glasses like that, and fill them up with water, and then turn them upside down so they've got no air in them. And then you take something like a battery, like this thing. Then you uh, take two electrodes and put one under each glass. And now you have to put something in the water to make it electrically conduct. A little bit of salt, of, uh, salt would do it, or uh, something like uh, vinegar or lemon juice, some kind of uh, weak acid. And overnight, you would collect some hydrogen and oxygen in there. But our little apparatus over here is a little bit more efficient and has been collecting a fair amount of hydrogen on one side. Now, how can I convince you that that's really hydrogen? Burn it? Well, OK, we could try that. So let's light a candle and see if we can burn the hydrogen. Now, of course, I have to get the hydrogen out of there somehow. So there's a little valve on the top. But if I open that, all the hydrogen would just go away. So I have to catch it in something. And I'm going to catch it in this little beaker. But you know, if I just put the hydrogen in the beaker, it wouldn't stay there. It would go up to the ceiling, right? So there's a clever thing. I can turn it upside down. Now when I catch the hydrogen in there, it will try to rise, and it will just stay in there. So I can walk around with the hydrogen, and it doesn't spill out. That's really pretty neat, right? So let's see if we can do that. Collect some hydrogen in here. So we'll open this valve. You'll see the water level come up. And we collect the hydrogen, right like that. And then we'll put it over the flame and see what happens. So that was pretty neat. But on the other side, I claim there's oxygen. How would we prove something is oxygen? Burn it? Well, oxygen, of course, doesn't burn, but it combines with something that's burning and makes it burn better, right? You need oxygen for a flame. So I'm going to take a little cotton swab. It's a stick, a wooden stick that's got cotton on one end. And I'm going to actually set the other end on fire by putting it on the candle. And once it's uh, burning, I'm going to bring it over above the oxygen and release the oxygen. And you'll, you can see for yourself whether that makes the fire burn better. And I think you see that it did. Now, I have one other demonstration here that illustrates this idea of uh, making hydrogen and oxygen. Here's another device that is quite similar. There are two tubes here. And you notice some bubbles coming up. And in fact, this is also an electrolysis device. Except this one isn't plugged in anywhere. So where is the electricity coming from that's separating the hydrogen and oxygen? Well, it's coming from a very unusual place. It's coming from this bright light. This bright light is shining back here on something called solar cells or solar panels. 
and the energy of the light is being converted into electricity. The electricity is electrolyzing the water and making hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other side. Then you could combine them and burn them and make heat and then make some kind of engine out of that. But it turns out there's an even better way to do that. There are certain chemical reactions that will combine the oxygen and hydrogen without making heat. In fact, you can make electricity directly. And those are called fuel cells, and you may have heard of that. Uh, right now, they're not very practical, they're not very economical, so you don't use them very much, uh, except in outer space and places like that. But right here, we have one of these fuel cells. It combines the hydrogen and oxygen, it makes water and electricity. And when we do that, we can turn on the switch here and use that electricity to turn a little motor here. So this is really pretty amazing because it illustrates most of the areas of physics that we've been talking about. We start back here with electrical energy. This light is plugged into the wall socket back here. So we start with electrical energy. The light, the, the lamp here converts the electrical energy into light energy. The light energy is converted back into electricity in this little solar cell. The electrical energy is converted into chemical energy by separating the hydrogen and oxygen. The chemical energy is then converted back into elect electrical energy in the fuel cell. The electrical energy then goes over to the, an electric motor, which actually converts it into magnetic energy, which we'll say more about in a moment. The, the magnets then are what makes the motor go around, making motional energy, kinetic energy it's called. And so uh, this is a wonderful demonstration of many of the principles of physics. And someday we may have cars or even airplanes that work on this principle using fuel cells and electric motors. But remember, the energy that ran this ultimately came from the wall socket back here. Now, of course, this could have been the sun, and that would have uh, helped out a bit, but then the solar panels would have had to be quite big in order to run a very big motor. So it turns out that although hydrogen is a very clean fuel, if you make it with electricity, um, you end up... Uh, um, causing a lot of pollution because most of our electricity is made by burning coal. And so if you're going to burn coal to make the electricity to make the hydrogen, you really haven't gained very much. You've made uh, clean cars, but you've made dirty power plants. And maybe someday uh, uh, some, form, some better form of nuclear energy will be developed that will uh, make all of this much more feasible than it is even today. Okay, so, um, so that's electrolysis. But it does, does bring up the issue of electric motors. And I said electric motors work by magnetism. So here I have two bar magnets with a north pole and a south pole that makes a big magnetic field right in here. And then I have two electromagnets. And if I pass a current through this uh, red and green coil, I can make the whole thing spin around and make an electric motor out of it. So here I'm converting electricity into energy of motion and doing it on a big scale so that you can actually see how it works. So all electric motors work that way. So an, a fun thing to do is to go home and count how many electric motors you can find at home. I bet you'd be really amazed at how many electric motors you have at your home if you count them all. But a thing you may not realize about electric motors is that you can run them backwards so that they produce electricity instead of consume electricity. And I can actually show you that with this demonstration. Uh, if I now spin this around by hand, uh, and look at the voltage that is produced by these spinning coils. I can do it in several ways. There's a little light bulb right here, and if I spin it around fast enough, you will see the light bulb blink. Every time this coil comes by the magnet, uh, there will be a pulse of electricity that will make this blink. If it's hard for you to see that from the back, you can look at the meter up there. And already you can see the meter moves when I move the coil. So let's spin it around nice and fast and look here. And now look up there, and you can see the electricity that we're producing from the motion. Now, I have one other demonstration of the same principle. Uh, here I have a little ring of aluminum, again, not at all attracted to a magnet. And if I lower this down over a coil, several hundred turns of wire, it's connected back here to the wall socket. And if I turn it on and then energize this magnet, an electric current will be induced in here, making it magnetic that magnet will be repelled by this magnet, and we'll see what happens. That was pretty fast, so let's do it again. Okay. Would you like to see it go higher? Okay. Turns out there is a way to do that. If we take a bar of iron and put it here, the iron concentrates the magnetic field and makes it go up higher. So let's try it with the iron. 
once again. Okay. Now, would you like to see it go even higher? Well, it turns out there's a way to do that. If I take this ring and cool it to the temperature of the liquid nitrogen, it turns out it will now become a better conductor of electricity. Most materials become better electrical conductors when you cool them down. And in fact, aluminum becomes about a seven times better conductor of electricity when it's at the temperature of liquid nitrogen than it is at room temperature. And as a result, the electric current that is induced in it is much larger. And therefore, it is a more powerful magnet. And so when I lower it down over the iron core and energize it again, we would expect to see it perhaps go even higher. So let's try that. Oop. Well, that was pretty high. Maybe we should try that again. You want to see it again? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll do anything for science. We'll see how high we can make it go with the iron and cooling it down to this very low temperature. Well, that's right. That's the principle of uh, induced electric currents. Now, uh, Ja, aber auch, wo bin ich da? Das letzte Mal, wo ich das noch gewusst habe, das war in der Schweizer Alpen. Gewesen. Aber das ist ja interessant. Hä? Huh? Hä? Huh? Hä? Huh? La dernière fois que j'ai su que j'étais dans les Alpes. Mais maintenant, tous les gens. Don't you speak English? Oh, English. Yeah. We can do that. Sure. I guess I'm lost. Oh, Last lost. time, I knew where I was. That wasn't the Swiss Alps, but here. Well, you're a very long way from home. You must. Yeah, have, I know. You must have made a wrong turn in Sweden. I probably did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well. So. Do you, Do you know that you're in Wisconsin? No, Wisconsin. <laughs> Wisconsin. You're very far from home. Very far from home, indeed. And And you came here. It looks like you have various forms of transportation here that brought yeah, you. Yeah, I came over by skis, and I skated across the Atlantic using oh. my <laughs> skates. Huh? From the 70s. Well, I suppose you're pretty tired then. And so, what are you, where are you trying to get? Well, I actually would like to do some tourist things. Oh, good. Like going to Carnegie Hall in New York. Yeah. Do you know how I get there? Sure. Practice, practice, practice. All right. All right. <laughs> how about in a special context? Oh. I mean, well, I see you have a map here. Yeah. Well, you know, I see one problem. This is an aeronautical map. This oh. is for airplanes. Yeah, that may explain some of my trouble, yeah. Yeah, well, that would certainly uh, be a problem. But I can tell you how to get back to Switzerland if you want to go back there. Yeah. Well, you head due east, and when you come to a really big ocean, turn left. Left? Yeah. Well, east, there is four possibilities at Yeah, least. north, south, east. Right. Right. And I don't know oh, how you don't know east. to well, find out. Actually, we have a gadget that will help you here. It's called a compass. Have you seen those? Uh, we've seen those in Switzerland, I think. Yeah. Even in Switzerland, yeah, yeah. they have these. Yeah. Well, that's pretty amazing. You know, this works on the principle of magnetism. You notice it has a little in on one side? In, yeah. And I that always that. points to the mm -hmm. north, because mm -hmm. this is a magnet, and the earth is a big magnet. Who oh, knew fun. that? fun. Great. Yeah. All right. So, uh, if you orient that so you're north, then that will always be east. And so you can use that to get yourself back home. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Nice meeting you. Bye. Well, that's pretty amazing. We had Isaac Newton from the fifth dimension, and now we've had a visitor from Switzerland. So you just never know uh, who will show up. But you know, if we're going to travel very far from home, and she was pretty far from home, but someday maybe we'll want to go to distant stars. So maybe I should make a star for you. If you look over above Mr. Lovell's head, you will notice a little dot that looks a little like a star, doesn't it? But of course it's not. This is just a, a dot of light that is produced by a very powerful laser. Now you also notice that you can see the dot over there, but you can't see the laser beam here. And that's because there's nothing for the light to scatter off of. But I can fix that with uh, two erasers that have a lot of chalk dust. And if I turn off the lights and make a little chalk dust here, you'll be able to see the laser beam.
So that's pretty neat. But speaking of stars, have you ever been out uh, on a clear night and looked at the stars and noticed that they kind of twinkle? Have you ever wondered why that is? I want to show you. I'm going to light this burner again, and I'm going to bring it over underneath the laser beam, and I want you to watch what happens. So you see that indeed the star appears to twinkle. Now, you may have thought that light travels in a perfectly straight line. And it travels in a pretty straight line, but not perfectly straight. And that's because it is bent by the air. And depending on how dense the air is, it's bent more or less. Now, you may know that hot air is less dense than cold air. And so by heating the air, I made some turbulence in the air above the burner. And when the light goes through that turbulent air, it seems to move around a little bit. And that's what happens when you look at the stars out on a clear night through the turbulence of the atmosphere. You see something that looks uh, very much like that. Now, um, speaking of lasers, there's another thing we can do with this laser. Um, you might think that light goes in a straight line, but I want to show you that I can make the light go around a coiled up uh, piece of plastic. So if I send the light in one side like this, you see it goes round and round inside, and eventually it, it comes out right over here, if I can hold it still. And uh, this is something appropriately called a light guide, because it guides the light round and round until it comes out this other side. Now, light guides are very important, and someday we'll uh, uh, use uh, even more of them than we do today. But I have here a very interesting example of a light guide. This is a very thin, flexible light guide. And it's about 30 meters long. That's about 100 feet. It would go up to the back of the room and down here again if it weren't all coiled up like this. And if one puts light in one end, it comes out the other end. And I want to use this to demonstrate to you that light doesn't travel from place to place instantaneously, just like sound. Remember, I said that the sound from my voice takes a little while to reach your ears, about 750 miles per hour. Light travels very much faster, but it's not instantaneous. Light takes a while to go around through that distance. And to illustrate that, we have a little circuit back here that produces a pulse of light, just like the thing that made a pulse of sound before. You can't see it. It's uh, sort of hidden from you here. But the yellow thing there is the pulse of light that is produced in this uh, electric circuit that we have here. And the light goes through a little short segment of this that's about uh, five centimeters long. And it goes around in a loop, and it's detected and the blue thing is the received light. And you see, indeed, uh, the received light is delayed the tiniest little bit from the uh, transmitted light. And furthermore, it, it lasts longer. So again, the light sort of reflects around. And uh, also, the electrical circuit doesn't respond instantly. But what I want to do now is take this little short piece of light guide out and show it to you. So now you can see, indeed, the light was going through that because it's gone now. And I want to put this much longer one in about 100 feet long. So I'll put that in here and make the light go through this much longer piece of light guide. So there we are. You see, it's moved over to the right in exactly the same way as when I move the microphone away from the speaker. And that's a very, very short time. The time that that corresponds to is about 100 billionths of a second, or a tenth of a microsecond. A microsecond is a millionth of a second. So that's an extremely short time. So uh, light doesn't travel instantaneously. It takes a while. But it travels at a very, very fast speed. And in fact, that's important, because you may have heard that you can't travel faster than the speed of light. And so far we know, as we know, that's exactly true. And so if one is to ever travel to a distant place away from the Earth, like even the nearest star is four light years away, that means even traveling at that very high speed, it would take four years to get there. So uh, that's going to require some real breakthroughs in technology if we're to ever travel to uh, very distant places. But you know there's science fiction movies and things where they do that all the time. And one particular science fiction movie has a special device called a transporter that will sort of magically transport people from one place to another. They dematerialize one place and reappear somewhere else. Well, that's really very fanciful technology. And we have no idea how one would uh, do something like that or whether it's even possible. But we do have one last demonstration that will kind of look a little bit like that. But our demonstration is not a real transporter, but it's all done with mirrors and, uh, and lights. 
So with that, I want to put on my hat. We'll open the curtain. We'll bring out the liquid nitrogen cloud that we use for all of the endings for all of our 153 some odd shows. And I will step into the transporter and thank you all for coming. <laughs>